All right, well, I think church is a place where we're able to be vulnerable, genuine, authentically who we are, whether you've been walking on the clouds, everything's going great, or you feel like you've been hit by the Mack truck of life and you're struggling and barely holding on, exhausted, overwhelmed, tired. But you should be able to be who you are anytime you walk through the doors of a church and known by who you are fully. That's why we're going to start today's message with a little confessional. I want to know if any of you have ever been addicted to soap operas. Anybody? Bold and the Brave, uh, Bra is that uh, Young and the Restless, General Hospital, 90210, I don't know, does that count? Uh, so are the days of our lives. My grandmother used to watch that. And there's Marlena. One minute she's demon possessed. The other minute she's the prom queen. And there's Victor. And the, you know, one moment they're the hero. And the next moment they're kind of in the shadows, monologuing, and all these dark thoughts. And the reason I bring that up is because if you read the book of Samuel or 2 Samuel, uh, a colleague of mine, Jim Somerville, said, it should really be called the biblical soap opera, the, the bold and the biblical. Because you have... Uh, David, and, and in one moment David's great and everybody loves him and a heart after God's heart and then, then you have his affair with Bathsheba and, and his train wreck of his relationships with his kids as a dad. And then you have Saul who's head and shoulders above everyone else and he's doing great things and he's delivering Israel in victory and then he's consulting witches and he's, he's uh, taking the reins by his own hand and he has nothing to do with God. And so you have this, you know, the, the good and the bad and the ugly of every character of scripture. You have intrigue and betrayal and murder and lust. It fits perfectly to a soap opera dialogue and script, but it's in the Bible. So I feel a little bit like, as Judy read today's text, we have whew, just this, this text kind of dropped on us. King Saul, according to the text, is not doing so well. God is... It, it even says that God regrets ever anointing Saul to be king. So you're going to have to bear with me for a second. I'll try to give you a, a short snapshot for those of us who may not know King Saul well. This is not better call Saul, Saul Goodman, uh, you know, all deference to Bob Underkirk. But no, this is Saul, the first king of Israel. And so we've got to backtrack in history a little bit. What's going on here before we get into it? the meat of the text. So Israel, if you remember, was enslaved in Egypt. Moses, you've heard of him, led them out with God's help. God delivers the people of Israel. And then Israel has faith leaders who basically are God's representative, but God is leading Israel. So then you have Moses, you have the judges, then you have the prophet Samuel, who we've heard mentioned in today's text. Samuel is the de facto religious leader and guide and spiritual mentor for all of Israel. But the Israelites see that Samuel's getting old, his kids are not of good substance or character, they're bums, they're, they're cheats, they take bribes, it says in scripture, and the people say, this is not our future. We don't want those guys to be our leader when Samuel passes, so give us a king, like all these other countries. We want a king, yeah, that's a ticket. We want a king who can fight our battles, who can consolidate power, and the king will be great. This will be great. So the prophet Samuel calls all the people together at a place called Mitzpah, and Mitzpah is a significant place. It's not just a place on the map because Samuel the prophet is not happy that the people of Israel want a king. Why? Well, because the prophets and the religious leaders kind of have power and I think part of him doesn't want to give that up but a part of him also says from God, a king will eventually, somewhere along the line, you might have some good kings, but somewhere along the line, you're gonna have a king who thinks only of himself. He'll use your sons to fight his wars. He'll take your daughters for his harems. He'll tax you to build whatever he wants to build. And he's going to be a taker. And he might forget about God and think he's everything that makes Israel tick. 
So Samuel calls the people together mitzvah because the last time as the people of Israel are seeing these threats, like these the national security threats, they see Philista, which is a country on the, the coast of the Mediterranean. And the Philistines have bronze weapons and chariots, something the Israelites don't have. They have more soldiers than Israel. You've heard of Goliath. He's a Philistine later in the story. But this first encounter with the Philistines, they gather this large army and Israel says, oh boy, we are in trouble. So they pray to God, they pray to Samuel, God help us because we are outgunned, outmanned, we need help. And God shows up. And it's the first underdog story of the Bible. They rout the Philistines and it's such a great battle that we'll need the slide for this one. They erect a giant stone, that guy, called the Ebenezer Stone long before Ebenezer Scrooge. And this stone means God's help. And the stone was meant to remind the people of Israel at mitzvah, whenever they saw it, God bailed us out here. We prayed to God, God saved us. And I imagine almost the prophet Samuel leaning up against this thing as the people are saying, give us a king, give us a king, and saying, you want a king? Don't you remember what God did here? That worked out all right, right? But hey, you want a king? Fine. All right. I'll give you a king. You want a king? Great. Here's your king. Samuel's not happy. To his credit, he calls Saul. Uh, God says, Saul's the one I anoint. God's Holy Spirit comes upon Saul. Saul seems to be a great choice for king. He comes from a wealthy family. His daddy's got all kinds of resources. He's handsome and tall, and he's a head and shoulders above everyone else. God... He's, he's good enough, he's smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like him. They're excited. So he calls Saul together in the presence of all the people. And when he calls Saul on stage to be introduced as the first king of Israel, Saul is actually, I think we have slides of this as well, Saul is actually hiding amongst the luggage. He doesn't want to be king. I didn't sign up for this. I don't want to be king. What do I know about kinging? And so it's not, a, it's not a great inauguration. To his, to his credit, Saul goes home, and during the first year of his kingship, Israel's in trouble. And Israel's being attacked. There's a town called Jabesh Gilead. I'll keep this moving. Jabesh Gilead has another nation come and meet at their gates, the Ammonites. And the Ammonites say basically to the men of Jabesh Gilead, listen, we're going to work out this deal with you guys. We have more soldiers than you. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to protect you. Every month we'll come around. It's like Polly Walnuts from The Sopranos. We'll come around every month. You guys give us some of your crops and some of your best, and we'll promise not to wipe you off the face of the earth. Sound like a good deal? Great. And to make sure that this, to seal the deal, we're going to need one more thing from you, people of Jabesh Gilead. Bring all your fighting men out, and we're just going to gouge out the right eye of each one of them. Uh, You had us when you talked about the monthly tribute. That didn't sound great. But when you talked about the eye, we're going to need a few days to think this over. So the Ammonites leave. The people of Jabesh Gilead said, help! They call out for Saul. They say, we got this king. He's going to fight our battles. Some messengers go to Saul. He's out there plowing his field. He says, what? He's filled with righteous indignation and anger. He chops up his oxen. He sends out a piece to each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, though I'm a product of the 80s, uh, you, you ever watch a Karate Kid or any Rocky movie? They used a the phrase in the 80s, you're dead meat, man. You're dead meat. Well, I think the, the King Saul actually coined this phrase because he said, Take this oxen meat to the tribes of Israel and tell all the men, if you don't come help me rescue Jabesh Gilead and join me together as a nation to fight on behalf of one of our weaker cities, you're going to be dead meat to me. Basically, get out and help me. So they do. 330,000 guys go out, help Saul fight. He wins the day. Everybody's like, I knew it. I knew that we should have this guy as king. This guy's great. He's fantastic. So no problem, right? Why is there any problem 
with Saul being king. He looks good. He fits all the bill. He's a great poster child. You know, he's a Tom Brady of Israel at this moment. Everybody loves him. But then it starts to go downhill. Philistia comes back. And God tells Saul there's going to be another war. But I want you to wait. Wait for the prophet Samuel. Wait for me. Prophet's going to offer prayers and burnt offerings. You're not to fight this war without me purifying the soldiers and knowing that I am with you in this battle. So Saul's waiting. He's got a war to fight. He's waiting one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, six days. His men start to desert. They're starting to leave. They're starting to go home. There's supposed to be a war. There's nothing going on. We're going to go back to our houses. Seven days Saul waits for Samuel to show up, and finally he loses his patience, and he says, listen, I've got a war to fight. Don't worry about the prophet. Don't worry about the prayers. I'll just offer the burnt sacrifice, and we'll go. Right as he's burning stuff, here comes Samuel. I don't know why he's delayed, but he's delayed, maybe. And, and at, the, at the moment, he says, Saul, what are you doing? God said, wait. God said, don't do this without me. Now, this doesn't apply to any of us. We never get headstrong and say, oh, I got this. I, I'm not going to pray about it. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just, I got this. Saul becomes his own self-promoter. There is never a time in Scripture where Saul seeks God, asks God's help. Saul says, I've got it. Later in, in Scripture, his son and his armor bearer, you'll have you go read that story. They become war heroes, but Saul makes a dumb rule. His son eats something they're not supposed to eat while they're fighting. He's going to kill his son. People say, you're crazy. What are you doing? And then finally, the straw that breaks the camel's back is the Amalekites, the thing that happens just before today's text. King Agag and the Amalekites, when Israel came in from Egypt, they ambushed them. This caravan of people immigrating into the promised land, weaponless. The Amalekites descend on them, kill a bunch of men, women, and children, and have been conducting raids all the time since. Uh, in a political sense, King Agag would be similar to our Idi Amin, uh, Pol Pot. He's a butcher. He's ruthless. He's a monster. So God tells Saul, you're going to go fight and wipe out King Agag. Kill him, destroy his town, destroy his people. Might be a little problematic for some of us because it sounds like God's ordaining a genocide, but he's, he's asking Saul to deal with somebody who's been a butcher. Saul goes, fights, and it reads that Saul looked around and his men said, hey, listen, there's some pretty good sheep, there's some pretty good cattle, there's some good-looking women. Give us some of the spoils of war because, you know, we give us a little something for, you know, the effort. And so Saul says, all right, fine. Prophet Samuel shows up. Saul says, hey, great news. I beat the Amalekites. Everything's good. And Samuel says, Saul, God told you to kill this king. And God told you to give everything that you conquered over to God. Your guys are taking the best stuff. And it says, everything that was worthless, weak, or useless, you killed. But you took all the best stuff for yourself. What are you doing? The kingdom's going to be taken from you. Here's where the text really gets problematic. Just earlier in Samuel 15, it says in verse 29, God never changes God's mind. He's not like people. But then we read, God regrets making Samuel a king. And though, I'm sorry, Saul king. <laughs> Got my S's confused. And then when Saul is confronted by the prophet Samuel, and he says, oh my gosh, you're right. I should not have done this. I didn't listen to God. I gave in to the pressure of my peers and all the people. I wanted to, I wanted to satisfy the army, so I gave in and I let, them, you know, I let them have all the spoils of war. And I know that's not what I'm supposed to do. Forgive me. And here's where the text gets really tough. Samuel says, no. I won't worship God with you. This kingdom, your days are done. Your responsibility as king is finished. God has rejected you. And I say it's problematic because as a people in Christ, don't we always say if somebody confesses, God forgives. But it appears in this text like God doesn't. Challenging. 
Saul is now persona non grata and tells the prophet, go to Jesse's family. I'm going to show you who you're going to anoint as the next king. Samuel says, this is treasonous. If Saul finds out, he's going to kill me. And here's the other issue with Saul. He's unstable. I, I read the text. I feel sorry for Saul, right? Samuel does, shows up late. He's got to fight a war. People have are pressuring him to do something, to act, to be the king they've called him to be. So he's caught between the tension of what God has asked him to do and the pressure of his peers. And the second thing that is really problematic or tough in this text, and I say this is not a softball text, this is a tough, tough text. It says that God sends an evil spirit to torment Saul. I'll say that one more time. It says, God sends an evil spirit to trouble or torment Saul. So when we talk about theodicy or how does evil exist with a good God, this test is a challenge. Are we saying that God sends and tests us with evil? Does a good God do that? Isn't God good? Or are we saying God allows Saul to be challenged with things that are tempting that are evil? And so this is an adversarial relationship. If you line it up with some other biblical texts like the first chapter of James, for example, it says God never tests us with something evil and tempts us with evil in order for there to be a good God outcome. That's not what a good God does. So you have really two theologies about how evil and good God and evil work in tandem or not or against each other in Scripture. That's why I always say, you know, when, when people try to cram every theology together and say it all says the same thing. No, you have two biblical writers who believe different things about how evil works in the world and describe it in light of their faith. But they're not saying the same thing. So the text is challenging that way. All right, back to my point of my sermon. Do you have a point in this sermon? Yes, I do. Stick with me here. All right, I just needed to give you that background. Oh my gosh, how long is this sermon going to be? All right, stick with me. Samuel goes to Jesse's son. It's almost like a Cinderella story, right? He sees Eliab. He says, this guy, he's king material. He looks good. He's strong. He's strapping. He's going to be a good fighter. People will follow this guy. And God says, nope. You see what your eyes are telling you. You're reading the book on its surface. God sees inside a person's heart. He knows what the substance of a person is. So with Eliab and Shinadab, uh, Abinadab and Shimea and all these other brothers, he goes down the road, and I say it's like a Cinderella story because Samuel eventually comes to the end of the boys who are gathered at Jesse's house and says, this is all the sons you've got? He says, well, there's this other one, this younger kid. You know, she's, she's sweeping up the cinders out of the fireplace. He's out uh, taking care of the sheep, but we'll call him in. So he calls in David. And again, the humanness of the text pops out here because didn't we just get done saying that God judges on the inside, not on appearance? But how is David described? Well, he's good looking. He's got beautiful eyes. I thought we were beyond that. But anyway, God says that's the one. And it's this beautiful phrase in the text that says, the Lord sees beyond the surface of the skin. The Lord sees our heart. So, uh, Slide one, please, of uh, Bill Irvin. If you've got it, sorry, that's Saul hiding in the baggage again. One more. Uh, oh, that's uh, the burnt offering. Sorry, keep going. Up, oh, one more. Sorry, here we go. Yes. All right, so what do you see here? Uh, you might see an old man, an older man looking kind of outdoorsy. Uh, Bill Irvin was a, a person of faith. He he hiked the entirety of the Appalachian Trail from Maine to Georgia blind with just his dog, Orient. He wrote a book about it called Blind Courage about how his faith and his four-footed companion, if you've ever hiked the Appalachian Trail, it's rocky. There are places where I don't know how he did it but he talks about walking by faith. People saw a blind man with a cane. God sees something else. Next slide. <clears throat> Claudette Colvin. How many of you have heard of Rosa Parks? Mm. <clears throat> Rosa Parks, according to most history, the first 
woman, a uh, civil rights leader, to refuse to give up her bus seat on the Montgomery buses um, as, a, as a moment of personal uh, defiance for equality. Two ladies actually did that very same thing almost a decade before Rosa Parks. Claudette Colvin is one of them. She was 15 years old, a uh, teenager, coming back from work with three of her friends. Bus driver asked them to move because they were sitting up front. And she said, we're tired, we can't, we won't. We heard Reverend uh, Dr. King, and we believe we have every much a right. At 15 years old, she's arrested. Some saw an agitator, a black, many other labels used for her. But in here, God sees somebody with courage. That's my servant. Next slide. <clears throat> Johnny, a kid with Down syndrome. Some people just see the disability. Johnny is famous because he worked in a grocery store. What do you say? What's the big deal? Lots of people work at grocery stores. Well, Johnny in his grocery bagging decided after he heard the corporate um, corporation talk about caring for customers, he said, you know what? I'm going to do something to help people feel special when they come through the grocery store line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with my parents and they're going to give me a thought for the day, an inspirational thought for the day. And I'm going to print them out and every person who comes through my line, I'm going to hand them a thought for the day and thank them looking into their eyes for shopping at our store. <clears throat> and the store manager, one month later, said that they had problems at the store. What was the problem? The problem was that people were lining up in Johnny's register down the frozen food aisle, even after they were opening other registers, and the manager would say, ma'am, sir, we've got this register. No, no, no. I'm here to hear Johnny's thought for the day. And then other people in the store, other employees, the, the florists started taking the flowers that were going bad that they would sell, you know, the discount stickers, the orange stickers on the flowers that are, you know, a week old or getting ready to be thrown out. They bought the flowers that were on sale and they began to cut them and, and go to the ladies in the store and say, ma'am, would you like to have a corsage from the florist department here? We'd love to give you this as a thank you for shopping at our store. And on and on, different employees thought about, how can I see this as, and think about when you go to the grocery store. You're making a transaction. Maybe you don't even say, maybe you say hello, and, you know, what's the total? Each of them taking the time to say, you matter. And this is more than a business transaction. You are human beings, and whatever you brought into our grocery store this day, we want to treat you with compassion and love. Last slide. <clears throat> Israel Kamakuego, uh, we had a children's message many years ago, and I had the kids sit here, and I, I had Israel's picture up here, and they sa I said, what do you see? And the kids were a little embarrassed. They didn't want to say anything mean. None of them said that he was fat, <clears throat> but one of the children said, well, he's a little overweight. I said, yeah. Yeah. They said, he looks kind of like he's, he's uh, having fun in the pool. I said, yeah. And he's, one person said, he looks kind of like um, Maui in Moana. And I said, yeah. And people looked at Israel and said, here's a bigger man. They, maybe they made a judgment that he wasn't handsome or he wasn't fit. But God sees something else. When Israel opens his... Israel is the one who sings this song. God sees beauty well beyond the surface. And we sometimes miss it. Because we see only what our eyes see. The, the moral to the story, the difference between Saul and David is this. Saul loved himself. He built a monument to himself, talking about his own accomplishments. 
He loved things and accomplishments. And, and the story basically says no matter how famous you are, how skilled you are, how many trophies you have, how many diplomas, how many accolades, life isn't measured in, in the stuff that you've achieved. It's measured how much do you love God and love each other. We sometimes see, oh, he's tall, he's handsome, he's good enough. That's our guy. God says, look a little closer. Now tell me, what do you see? Something each of us could practice, I think, probably a little more, this Father's Day and beyond.